So hello and good morning from Montreal. Good evening if you're joining us from elsewhere where your time zone is opposite ours. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Sundberg and it's a pleasure to host today's celebration of Missing Voices, South Asian Perspectives on the Gulam Archives. So thank you for joining us to celebrate really the launch of this project and the culmination of a lot of research work from a lot of different participants. It's a pleasure to be able to have some of those panelists and contributors on the call today and you'll get to hear comments from a few of them in conversation with Victoria Dickinson and with my colleague, librarian Lauren Williams, who's going to tell us a little bit about the program and the research project to open up the event. It's just a pleasure um, to say that we uh, this event has been certified as sustainable by our McGill Office of Sustainability. So uh, a boon of the virtual event is that we can have people tuning in worldwide with a very low carbon footprint for the event. So much as it would be a pleasure to have you all here in person, it is a sustainable option to be able to have a Zoom call and bring people in from all over. So thank you for tuning in and Zooming in. When Final piece, I'm joining you from a specific place on the McGill downtown campus, which is situated on land that has long served as a place of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. And Roar and the McGill University recognizes, respects, and honors those nations as the traditional stewards of the land and territories and waters on which this place stands today. So for my part and my colleagues here in Montreal, that's where we're joining you from. And it's worth taking a moment to acknowledge that. Now, I'm going to pass the virtual microphone to Victoria Dickinson. Uh, apologies, Lauren Williams is first up on the program and then Victoria. So Lauren, you can take it away. Uh, all right, so good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all virtually to the Rare Books and Special Collections Department of McGill Library. My name is Lauren Williams, and I'm the curator of the Blackerwood Natural History Collection that is held here in the Rare Books Department. We've come together this morning to celebrate the launch of uh, a new website called Missing Voices, South Asian Perspectives on the Gwilym Archives, and we're very glad to have you with us today. So I'll start by giving you a little bit of background on this project. Back in 2018, Dr. Victoria Dickinson, adjunct professor in the Rare Books Department of McGill Library, and I applied for a grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council to study an incredible collection of paintings held in the Blackerwood Collection, created by two British women named Elizabeth Gwillem and her sister Mary Simons, while they lived in the Madras region of India, now Chennai, between 1801 and 1807. Our application for the research grant was successful, and so Victoria assembled an international research network of scholars who were each interested in examining these paintings from a different angle. We had an architecture professor who was interested in studying the temples and other structures in the backgrounds of the paintings. Dress and dance historians wanted to study the ceremonies, <clears throat> pardon me, garments and other things depicted in the backgrounds of the paintings. Botanists, ichthyologists, uh, and ornithologists were interested in exploring the flowers, fish, and birds depicted in the paintings and so forth. Eventually, our research network grew to include over 50 members, and we were able to share their findings in a series of webinars that are now available on our YouTube channel, some of which have been viewed thousands of times, and on our research project website, thegwillemproject.com, which I encourage you to explore. Through this research, we were also able to locate other works by Elizabeth Gwillem and Mary Simons. The hundreds of letters that they sent to their family back in England are held at the British Library, and an incredible album of landscape scenes painted mainly by Mary Simons uh, is held at the South Asia Collection in Norwich. The grant funding allowed us to facilitate the digitization of these collections, and our aim was to bring these collections together in a new digital archive. So we approached a federal organization called Digital Museums Canada, or DMC for short, to seek further funding for the creation of a website to showcase this digital archive. During the application process, the DMC encouraged us to think about ways in which we could also engage a younger audience with the idea of archives and history through this website, and also to explore more explicitly the complicated history of British colonialism in India during this period. Many of the scholars in our research network had discussed the colonial context of the paintings in their work, but the DMC suggested that we could adapt these themes to be more accessible to a younger and more general audience. 
This conversation and many more with scholars, young people, and members of the South Asian diaspora in Canada led to the creation of Missing Voices, the website that you'll be hearing about today. Victoria Dickinson will tell you all about the website shortly, but in the meantime, I'd just like to thank a few of the many people whose hard work and dedication made this project possible. First off, my sincere thanks to our speakers today, to Manakshi Menon, one of the scholars who contributed written work to the site, to Alicia Sani, who created and hosted the podcast that is featured on the site, and to Deborah Thiagarajan and Rekha Vijaya Shankar of the Dakshina Chitra Museum for their invaluable participation in the project. I'd also like to thank the other contributors to the website, Vinita Damodaran, Tadlika Gupta, and Marika Sardar for their incredible work, along with the members of our advisory council, whose feedback and, and suggestions were what made this project possible. I'd also like to thank Edit Audio for their dedication to producing the podcast, Victoria Dickinson for all of the content for the website she created and her organizational efforts to bring the project together, Alex Cohn, Anna Rogers Butterworth, and the entire team in McGill's Digital Initiatives Department for their support and hard work on the technical side of the project, Richard Lauren for his project management and technical expertise, Anna Winterbottom and Amelia Greenfield for their help in editing the site, and our project partners, McGill Library, the South Asia Collection in Norwich, the Dakshina Chitra Museum in Chennai, and the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. And last but certainly not least, thank you to Digital Museums Canada for their funding and support of this project. As the librarian responsible for looking after the Gwilym Collection here at McGill, I just wanted to say how gratifying it's been to see the incredible amount of interest, both from the academic community and the public, in exploring these paintings and the cultural context surrounding them. As a result of both the Shirk Research Project and the Missing Voices website, the Blackerwood Collection has never been busier, and I encourage anyone in the audience who'd like to know more about the collection to reach out and I'll be happy to help. So I'll turn things over to Victoria now, the lead content co uh, coordinator for the website, to tell you more about the project and to introduce our speakers for today. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. I'm now going to share my screen. Share my screen. Uh, and I hope everyone can see my screen. Yep, great. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, Lauren's already done many thank yous, but before I introduce you to the website and our speakers today, I want to begin by thanking all those who made this project possible. It's been a real pleasure to work with Lauren, Richard, Alex, and Anna, and our colleagues at Digital Initiatives on what has been an often challenging but very rewarding project. I'd also like to acknowledge especially the role of the Advisory Council and the members of the Gwildham Research Network, as well as Digital Museums of Canada, whose comments, insights, and knowledge shape the site, moving it from a more conventional presentation of an online archive to become a site that stimulates us to question our assumptions and to rethink the role of archival collections. I'd like to thank particularly the members of the Advisory Council, Satwinder Baines, Sonia Daliwal, Sutama Ghosh, Amrita Kumarata, Alicia Sani, Marika Sardar, Pamela Upal, as well as Laboni Islam of the Aga Khan Museum. Sorry, I'm just going to, there. I'm going to present a very brief tour of the site, which is part of the McGill Library digital exhibits. The site was designed on the Spotlight platform, which is an open source software that enables librarians, curators, and other content experts to create websites that showcase collections and objects from a digital repository. Uh, our digital repository began with a born digital collection that brought together the materials from Montreal, Norwich, and London into the online Gwilym archives. So the Gwilym archives does not exist in any particular collection, but is housed online. And so this digital archive, bringing this digital archive to the public was the first step in making accessible the works of Elizabeth and Mary Simons. But as we worked on the project and met with our partners, advisors, and colleagues, we realized that if these digital colonial archives were to be of value to, value to people today, we'd have to see the archives themselves in a very different way. We asked whose voices were unheard, whose stories were unrecorded in the archives. And with the help of the people you'll hear from today and many others, we attempted to bring back some of these missing voices. So whose voices have been lost? 
A podcast is a wonderful medium to hear new voices and reach a wider audience. Alicia Sani, who will be speaking in a few minutes, reached out to the South Asian community in Canada to create a four-part series. And I really encourage you to listen to the podcast. And you can, of course, get your podcast on any of the platforms uh, where, where podcasts are housed. We also ensured the transcripts of the podcast episodes were uh, available in Tamil, not only for Canadian Tamil speakers, but we hope for an Im increased audience in India. The scholars, librarians, and researchers of the Gwilym uh, Research Network have been working together now for over three years. And I have to tell you, it's been an extraordinary opportunity to meet scholars from India, the UK, Canada, and the US who've come together around this digital archive and shared their insights and their um, experience and knowledge with the network. It's, it's really been an incredible opportunity. But we asked four members of our network to share their perspectives on the archives. Minakshi Menon will join us today. But we're also grateful, as Lauren has mentioned, to Vanita Damodaran of the World Environmental History Center at the University of Sussex, to Lika Gupta of the India Institute of Craft and Design, and Marika Sardar, an independent curator in Toronto, for their contributions to this website. Working with our partners in India brought a wealth of new ideas and knowledge to the Gwilym Project. The Dakshina Chitra Museum in, in Chennai became our partner on the site, and they developed a special project to add new images to the site, which you'll soon hear about. Grâce au financement du Musée numérique du Canada, nous sommes en mesure de fournir une version française du site. So this is a site which is available both in French and English, as well as the Tamil transcriptions and some other Tamil information. But we also added alt text and optimized the site for screen readers to ensure that Missing Voices is as accessible and inclusive as possible to all users. Now that you've seen the key elements of the site, and I encourage you to go and look at the site online and uh, enjoy the podcasts and all the um, materials, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today who will share with us their contributions to Missing Voices. I'm going to introduce all of our speakers and then I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and we'll have a conversation. Alicia Sani is the host for the Missing Voices podcast. She loves experimenting with new social platforms and storytelling formats that cut through the noise to stand a chance at survival in the, atten in the attention economy and that will also have a lasting impact. And we hope that these podcasts will have that impact. When she's not hosting podcasts that speak to second generation millennials, she is a staff editor with the New York Times opinion section. But Professor Menakshi Menon is a member of research group Krauss, Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, where she leads a working group on the famous Dutch herbal, the Hortus Indicus Malabaricus. Uh, she's working on the Eurasian life of a 17th century European botanical classic. Menakshi is also working on a man monograph with the working title, Empiricism's, Empiricism's Empire, Natural Knowledge Making, State Making and Governance in East India Company, India, 1784 to 1830. And in 2022, she will be joining the Department of Social Sciences of Medicine at McGill. And we are very fortunate to have her coming home to McGill. Reka Vijayashankar is the assistant librarian and photographer at the Dakshina Chitra Museum in Chennai. Reka has been engaged with the Gwilym Project with Deborah Thea Garajan and has provided much of the content for the site and you're going to hear later from her. And Dr. Deborah Thea Garajan is an art historian, president of the Madras Craftist Foundation and the former director of the Dakshina Chitra Museum. She founded the Madras Craft Foundation in 1984 with the uh, st objective of establishing the mu museum in Mutakadu, Chennai, and the museum itself opened in 1996. I'm going to stop the share now. And it's my pleasure to welcome Alicia Sani. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning. Hello, everyone. 
Alicia, you developed the podcast for Missing Voices. And in your first podcast, you asked, what if archival material from the past, like the Gwillem Project, was retold or reimagined for today? What would that look like? How can we make sure South Asian voices are prioritized when we're talking about even this little sliver of Indian history? How did the podcast help you do this? So I think in some ways, um, this podcast is actually like a love letter to the South Asian diaspora. Um, and so really when we thought about and in the very early stages, what it would um, sort of sound like um, in those beginning days, um, what really became very clear to me was um, some sort of journey that listeners would follow along with me um, as I sort of understand my own hyphenated identity by really examining some of the structures and ways that, you know, my generation communicates. So primarily through social media and other types of digital platforms. And so sort of the starting point um, with thinking about, you know, archival material from the past and sort of rethinking about the Gwillem archive today really comes from a lens of um, this idea of the informal archiving and informal pr preservation of our day-to-day -day, day -day lives that we already do on social media. And how can we sort of think about that um, in the context of the research that, that we're all discussing today? And so in that process, um, we developed four podcast episodes that really focus on, on ideas around archiving practices used by the South Asian diaspora to collect, preserve, and reconstruct family and community histories. And so because I'm a journalist, the most natural way to sort of look at this um, it, research was um, through the inquiry and of a journalist. Um, and so it's really driven by South Asian voices um, in my own personal networks, through friends of friends, through um, media um, uh, acquaintances, friends in the media. And so I wanted it to feel um, formal in sort of the spirit of the research, but also informal in the way that a podcast should. And so that people in the South Asian diaspora can feel like they are connected connected to it because it's they are they sort of feel seen in in the actual um and and show <clears throat> one thing i'd like to add though is you know victoria you ask you know how can we make sure south asian voices are prioritized so one thing that i think is really important but when we think about this this question it's a really multi I mean, there's many answers to this question, but one thing that's really important to think of is I think this idea of um, disenfranchised grief. And it's something that a South Asian mental health professional discusses in the show in episodes one and four. She talks about this idea of what she says is hidden grief. And it's grief that's not really understood or talked about or discussed really openly in society or in public. And a lot of children of immigrants and second generation folks do feel this sense of grief, this sense of disenfranchised grief. Um, it's a very real feeling like you're sort of floating and untethered to your own history. And this is because of a lack of access maybe to grandparents, extended family, language barriers, you know, having family that might be from India in your ancestral land, but you know, that's how I sort of look at it with myself. You know, I have family on both sides of my parents who are there, but we don't, I don't have the same deep connection with them as I do with family here because, you know, I'm, I'm born and raised here. So that, that um, feeling of feeling untethered is very common. Um, and there's a lot of internalized shame with that. And so reconciling with this grief and what internalized shame means um, was a really um, hard but necessary thing to think about as I was making this podcast. Um, you know, when you're born in the West and you have family born in the West, but you're navigating all of the different factors and impacts that sort of make you who you are as your identity in real life and online and how we might sort of present some of those hyphenated aspects of our, of our identity online um, to sort of make up for the fact that, you know, um, we don't we don't have that ancestral knowledge or land right here. And so a lot of that is reconciling 
And so with the lack of maybe tangible resources, again, probably due to colonization, um, a lot of things like oral storytelling, narrative storytelling, this stuff is missing. And so this podcast is a way to sort of bring some of that tradition of oral storytelling um, into a more modern framework through a podcast. Um, and so that that's kind of really how we started to think about the show and and how to break down the episodes. Thank you very much, Alicia. Do you think it is possible to decolonize archives like this to make them? Are they valuable to South Asian people today? Can these archives be used in this reconstruction of memory, this easing of this disenfranchised grief? Is there any role for this? So I do think, um, you know, when we talk about decolonizing an archive, um, I know the word decolonize can, it's a bit of a loaded term. I think it means a lot of different things to different people. Um, and it's sort of a catch-all phrase, I think, to in many industries as, as decolonization is more openly discussed. Um, but I do think that sort of the guiding question which I discuss with Lauren Williams in the second episode is like how did the Gwilin project become a valuable piece of research in the first place you know like who decides what archival material is valuable and what really qualifies as an archive and so we broke these types of questions down with Lauren um, to really understand um, sort of the impetus uh, you know it's the very beginning of what it means to even uh, who denotes the value in the first place um, and I think, you know, as we further answer that question and try to deconstruct that question, it very naturally led to further questions about, you know, how are social media companies like Pinterest, like Instagram, and I think increasingly like TikTok, um, are they complicit in shaping our values about history? Um, and so this is really connected to this idea of our inherent need to document and collect and the role social media plays in um in 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 um documenting and collecting our personal histories and i think so much of our of our generation consumes what is like you know content creation by social media creators first and a lot of them are at the forefront of creating south asian um content for south the south asian diaspora specifically and they're the ones who are really you know, producing these document documentaries of rich histories in innovative, accessible ways, and honestly, that's that in itself is creating a digital archive in itself, a, a modern one, and that's kind of what this podcast is doing too. Is kind of contributing to that, and so I think a lot of these social media platforms, they're occupying a lot of space online, um, to you know, for the very reason of. Um, showing that history, you know, the, our personal histories, our shared his, histories, they're multidimensional. And um, and this is sort of an unspoken but concerted movement to, I guess you could say, democratize and decolonize our history. Um, and so to your point, um, Victoria, about um about memory making, I think, I think what what I what one of the most um telling um parts of of, of doing the interviews through this podcast it was actually with with Sonia Dollywell. I think I saw Sonia on the call. So hi, Sonia, if you're here. Um, I think Sonia said some really interesting things about um, understanding the role of an archive and how it actually, um, what role it plays in upholding um, and maintaining colonial infrastructures. And from her point of view and with her expertise, I think she very eloquently explained how archives are used to facilitate colonial governments, colonial policies, and what these records now hold is this legacy of what's been done to people um, through a perspective that is um, generally Eurocentric. And so this effort to decolonize the archive and the position of the archive is really important. And so um, navigating that um, with a very Western pedagogical framework is um, is a challenging thing to do. So um, Sonia gave a lot of great insights into how we can sort of rethink doing that as someone who works in library sciences. So I found that to be quite fascinating as someone, especially because it's very different from my perspective as a journalist. So um, I very much encourage you to listen to episode three where we discuss that. <laughs> 
Thank you, Alicia. And thanks for this, um, you know, really uh, tantalizing glimpse of what's in the podcast. And I urge everyone to listen to it. And uh, I think now I'd like to turn it over to Manakshi Menon. So Alicia, thank you again. And thank you for being so very much for being so, so much a part of this project. Thank and you. Uh, now I'll turn to Manakshi. Good morning, Manakshi. Good morning. Uh, great to be here. Barnakam. Manakshi, you've been a member of the Gwilym Research Network and had the opportunity to take a deep dive into the sisters' correspondence. What was your first impression of the archives and what kind of value does it have for researchers like yourself? Um, I'm a historian of 18th and 19th century colonial sciences in South Asia with an interest in the practices of British empiricism. That is the ways in which British actors of the period made sense of the world around them through centuries experience. Now, by the early 19th century, observation had become a fundamental practice in the natural and human sciences. So my first impression of the Gwilym archives was utter delight at what excellent observers both Elizabeth and Mary were. Elizabeth was very conscious about the need to refine her abilities of observation, to turn her individual acts of observation into something that could count as scientific evidence. Listen to her reason about how the climate of Madras could be viewed as comparable to that of England. And I'm going to read this out from a letter written by Elizabeth to her sister Hetty Simons in September, October 1806. She says, I have heard it remarked by some people that the climate of Madras, that is of the part of the coast, of this part of the coast is generally very much the same as that of England, allowing for the different degrees of cold and heat. What is asserted is that we have proportionally a cold or a hot, a wet or a dry season, as you have, and they are at the same times of the year. I have taken great pains to observe whether or not this observation be just, and generally, I have found by comparing your accounts with what we have felt that this is a correct notion. Last year, that is the summer of 1805, was one of the most extraordinary seasons remembered here by the oldest Indians. We had continual rains and the air was so temperate all the summer months that we had, as it were, three winters in succession. Now, as the winter is delightful to us, of course, we all rejoiced, and I wrote to you upon this head frequently and with exaltation, but it's sometimes occurred to me in the autumn that whilst we were unexpectedly enjoying this unusual temperament, that if such a proportionable change should happen in your climate, always too cold and damp, the consequences may be fatal to many, and as even here, I suffered from cold and spasms. I apprehended my dear mother would with difficulty bear the fogs and dews that must surround you. So she, she compares her observations of changes in the climate of Madras with those sent by her sister and mother about changes in the climate of England, and then quotes what she's heard from the oldest Indians. So she's bringing perception, she's bringing judgment, she's bringing reason together, as you can, as you've just heard, honing her skills as an early 19th century scientific observer. Now, early 19th century British science was very gendered. Women were marginalized and their practices of natural knowledge making uh, were given short shrift. The Gwilym correspondence presents us with women who were sophisticated practitioners of natural knowledge making. And I, I think that's very important. Thank you, Manakshi. And thank you for reading part of Elizabeth's letter. I do think their, their observations are fascinating. And we are 
it was wonderful to be able to both scan the letters and to transcribe them. And you can read those on the project website. But you chose, out of the 700 pages of correspondence, you chose a particular letter written by Mary Simons to her friend in London, the gardener Richard White, Reginald Whiteley. Can you tell us why you chose this letter for your contribution to the website and what it told you about the Gwillems and about uh, the colonial experience? Um, yes, I can. I chose uh, that particular letter because I read a great deal of post-colonial theory as a graduate student in the US. And I was struck by how well it, that is the letter, exemplified what the cultural theorist Homi Baba in his book, The Location of Culture, calls colonial mimesis. Now, in a famous sentence, Baba captures both the colonial anxieties and the subversive effects produced by colonialism's civilizing mission. The mimicry, he writes, and I'm quoting from Baba, is the desire for a reformed, recognizable other as a subject of a difference that is almost the same, but not quite. So here he's analyzing the desire that British colonizers felt to create tractable colonial subjects who'd accept the gifts of civilization brought by their masters without rebelling against colonial power. The angst that white colonizers experienced is born of their recognition that mimesis is always partial. The anglicized can never be the English. Colonized Indians, even if gifted the British constitution, will never comport themselves as their white masters do, will never produce exactly the same response to similar sets of events. There are passages in Elizabeth Gwillem's letters where she reflects on natives' abilities to ape the British. In one instance, she writes, they love finery and are certainly more fond of imitating us than is generally believed. They now copy us in all they can consistently as they heretofore copied the Muslims, their former masters. Mary's letter to uh, Whitley, to the, the one that I selected, mockingly reproduces black English, that is the English spoken by native Indians as slavish mimesis. The letter has an edge. It's, it's not merely an example of pranking language, which was not uncommon uh, in the period. Instead, it conveys the ever present fear that black servants would turn on their white masters given a chance. The letters written in 1803, uh, uh, that's three years before the notorious Velour Mutiny, in which Indian sepoys who up to that time were thought of as quite biddable, attacked their British officers. In my reading, Mary's letter to Whitley, a supposed response to his waggishness in sending her bags of seeds labeled in imitation Chinese characters, conveys the powerlessness of colonial mimicry. She's apparently, what she's doing, she's, she's reproducing a Tamil servant's English in it. And uh, Here's how the letter begins. She says, I send in your honor too many salams, so fine is sheets, and she means seeds, you send. I thinking master take too much trouble to keep so fine name. I directly make shigram, send bullock bandi, get black down dirt, some river is sand. Bullock make trouble, that sake never come soon. I telling what for so long time coming, you very well understand us half past five o'clock evening time, that is fresher time. This country's custom never keep in grown ishid hot time. That's it tomorrow morning to soon get up before hot time coming. Now, notice the mixture of Tamar and English, Shigram, which is the Tamar Shigram, come quickly. Uh, bandi, bandi, which is an Anglo-Indian word from the Tamil bandi or cart. 
then the letter ends on a distinctly threatening note. Mary, who is now voicing the black servant, cajoles Whitley to learn the native idiom. Or, she says, but if master make hungry upon me, directly cut off yours, cut his neck a strong wound. So here is a prescient warning for British rule in India. Thank you, uh, Manakshi. Do you, do, you've uh, talked about reading archives both against and with the grain. Is just coming back to this value of the archives, have these archives had, a, is it possible to decolonize them by doing this kind of reading, this against the grain reading and uh, to really, uh, to bring out this different kind of history? That, that's a very interesting question. The word decolonize can mean different things. As the post-colonial scholar Priyamvada Gopal remarked, there's no one size fits all decolonization. What indigenous studies scholars, when they speak of decolonization, for instance, Eve Tuck and Wayne Yong in their essay, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, they're referring to practices as understood in indigenous studies departments in North America. By decolonization, they mean undoing the practices of settler colonialism, that is giving the land back to those from whom it was stolen. It should not be used, they say, to describe, among other things, the methodologies that, de that seek to decenter dominant forms of analysis. That is, decolonization should not be used to describe methods that seek to undo, say, European categories of analysis in the humanities and social sciences. Now, the question of land ownership and land rights in South Asia, either today or in the past, cannot be addressed by invoking a settler indigene binary. So the indigenous rights definition of decolonization doesn't really fit the South Asian case. Homi Baba, whose work I just mentioned, has labored, as have the historians of the Subaltern Studies Collective, to show us how to decolonize the archives, how to read the archives against the grain. Now, I've used Baba's strategy to read Mary's letter to Whitley. Instead of making a straight reading of the letter, I read it to show the fear and anxiety that colonizers, whether men or women, felt when confronting the native case. And uh, for more on this, you have to buy our volume and read it. <laughs> Thank you, Manakshi. Manakshi is referring to the book, which is a product of the Grillman Research Network's uh, efforts. And it's going to be um, published by McGill Queen's University Press in uh, 2023, Women, Environment and Networks of Exchange, Elizabeth Gwilym and Mary Simons in India, 1801 to 1807. Thank you very much, Manakshi. Uh, I appreciate, again, your contribution to the project and uh, your reading against the grain and with the grain of the letters. I'd now like to turn to uh, Deborah uh, Thea Garajan and Rekha Vijayashankar, they're joining us from Chennai, where the Gulam family lived over 200 years ago. The Dakshina Chitra Museum is part of the Gulam Research Network and has also hosted exhibitions of the paintings made by Elizabeth and Mary, as well as the work of photographer Rekha Vijayashankar. Rekha cannot be with us today, but she's prepared a video, and I'd like Deborah to introduce Rekha's presentation. I'm going to now share my screen so we can enjoy uh, Reka's video. Yeah, Reka, as uh, Victoria said, is our assistant librarian. She's a passion for photography. She comes from a fisherman's family, so she comes with a very specific perspective when she looks at photographs and uh, the, the environment. Uh, she is a self-taught photographer, and I think I'll show the, the video because she explains how she saw the, the project. She speaks only Tamil. So. 
வணக்கம் என் பேர் ரேகா விஜயசங்கர் நான் தக்ஷின் சித்ராவில் ஒர்க் பண்ணிகிட்ருக்கேன் அசிஸ்டண்ட் லைப்ரரியனா அண்ட் ஃபோட்டோகிராஃபராக டெபி மேம் வந்து இந்த கில்லியம் ப்ராஜெக்ட் பற்றி என்கிட்ட சொல்லிவிட்டு இந்த பெயிண்டிங்ஸ்லாம் என் கையில் கொடுக்கும்போது இந்த மாதிரி பிளேஸஸ்லாம் நீங்கள் சர்ச் பண்ணி எடுக்கணும்னு சொல்லி கொடுத்தாங்க ஆரம்பத்தில் இந்த பெயிண்டிங்ஸ் பார்க்கும்போது எனக்கு ரொம்ப டஃப்பாக இருந்தது நம்ம இந்த மாதிரி இடத்துல எப்படி தேடி கண்டுபிடிச்சி எடுக்க போகிறோன்றது எனக்கு ரொம்ப வியப்பாகவும் இருந்தது பல நாள் எனக்கு தூக்கம் கூட இல்லை ஆனால் நான் டெய்லி அந்த பெயிண்டிங்ஸ் எடுத்து நான் பார்க்கும்போது இது எல்லாமே சிட்டி அவுட்டர் போனால் தான் நமக்கு கிடைக்கும் ஏன்னா ஐம்பது வருஷத்துலேயே நிறைய இடம்லாம் மாறி வந்துட்டுருக்கு ஆனால் இந்த பெயிண்டிங்ஸ் வந்து இரநூறு வருஷத்துக்கு முன்னாடி வில்லியம் சிஸ்டர்ஸால் இந்த பெயிண்டிங்ஸில் வரையப்பட்டது இந்த பெயிண்டிங்ஸ் நான் டெய்லி எடுத்து நான் பார்க்கும்போது இந்த மாதிரி சிட்டி அவுட்டர் தாண்டினா தான் இந்த மாதிரி பிளேசஸ்லாம் கிடைக்கும்னு சொல்லிட்டு நான் வந்து போன ட்ராவல் பண்ண இடங்கள்லாம் என்னென்னா செஞ்சி திருவண்ணாமலை திருப்போரூர் திருநீர்மலை மகாபலிபுரம் சிட்டி அவுட்டரில் திருவள்ளூர் டிஸ்ட்ரிக் அந்த மாதிரி நிறைய இடம் வந்து நான் ட்ராவல் பண்ணேன் அப்போ அந்த பெயிண்டிங்ஸில் இருக்கிற மாதிரி இடமும் எனக்கு கிடச்சிது ஸ்டார்டிங்கில் எடுக்கும்போது எனக்கு ரொம்ப சந்தோஷமாக இருந்தது இந்த மாதிரி பிளேசஸ் நம்மளால் சர்ச் பண்ணி எடுக்க முடிஞ்சதுன்ட்டு இந்த ஒரு ப்ராஜெக்டால் நான் வந்து நிறையா லேண்ட்ஸ்கேப் அண்டு வந்து கடல் சார்ந்த இடங்கள் நிறைய விமன் அண்ட் மென் எப்படி அவங்க வந்து லைஃப் ஸ்டைலில் அவங்க இன்னும் வாழ்ந்துட்டுருக்காங்கன்றத வந்து இந்த ப்ராஜெக்ட் மூலியமாக என்னால் போயிட்டு சர்ச் பண்ணி எடுக்க முடிஞ்சது தக்ஷின் சித்ராவில் வந்து நான் ஆர்ட் கிராஃப்ட்டு ஆர்கிடெக்சர் அண்டு ஃபோக் பர்ஃபார்மிங்ஸ் அந்த மாதிரி டான்ஸ் ஈவெண்ட்ஸ் தான் நான் எடுத்திருக்கேன் இந்த கில்லியம் ப்ராஜெக்ட் மூலியமாக நான் நிறையா என்ன கற்றுக்கிட்டேன்னா லேண்ட்ஸ்கேப் மானியூமெண்ட்ஸ் நிறைய பலதரப்பட்ட பீப்புளை வந்து நான் தேடி கண்டுபிடிச்சி எடுத்து அவங்களோட ட்ராவல் பண்ணும்போது எனக்கு ரொம்ப சந்தோஷமாக இருக்குது இந்த ப்ராஜெக்டை நான் எனக்கு கிடச்சி நான் அதை முடித்ததால் எனக்கு வந்து ரொம்ப ஒத்துழைப்பு கொடுத்தது தக்ஷின் சித்ரா டீம் அண்ட் என்னுடைய ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் என்னுடைய கொலீக்ஸ் இவங்களுடைய அந்த டீம் வந்து ஒன்றா இருந்ததால் தான் என்னால் இந்த வேலையை நல்லபடியாக முடிக்க முடிஞ்சுது எனக்கு இந்த ஒரு அரிய வாய்ப்பை வந்து கொடுத்த மெகில் யூனிவர்சிட்டி அண்டு தக்ஷின் சித்ராவுக்கும் நான் ரொம்ப கடமைப்பட்டிருக்கேன் ஏன்னா இந்த ஒரு ப்ராஜெக்ட் மூலிமா நான் நிறைய இடம் ட்ராவல் பண்ணது என் லைஃப்லேயே எனக்கு ஒரு பெரிய அச்சீவ்மெண்ட்டை தான் நான் நினைக்கிறேன் தேங்க்யூ வெரி மச் What, what uh, thanks, the, uh, thanks to Rekha, Deborah, and thank you for providing the video for Rekha to speak to us. And I hope she's watching today from Chennai. Um, I'd now like to speak, Deborah, to you about what you found as you worked on the project and contribute and worked on the exhibitions and on the project with uh, Rekha, how you saw the parallels between your own life and what the ex sisters experienced two centuries ago. So over to you, Deborah, to speak on this. Okay, well, it was a fascinating uh, journey, I would say, back 200 years as I read through the correspondence. I think that uh, Elizabeth's life and mine do have a parallel. I've been, I'm an American and I've been in India for 50 years, married to a, a South Indian from Tamil Nadu. And basically, I think we both wanted to learn about the city in which we live through close observation, uh, visual observation, I particularly of architecture. Um, I, I found it in architectural museum. And of course, Elizabeth through her, her close observation of birds and, and fauna and uh, botany. But, but um, uh, my house is probably only about two kilometers from where the Gwillams would have lived. And I'm sure that Elizabeth and I have walked many of the same streets as we explored the city in the Mylapore area around, around her house. First dirt roads then and, and paved roads now. And uh, one of the uh, areas which she would have visited would have been the, the Mylapore temple. You can see the temple car. This is a, a recent photograph of the temple procession. And she speaks of going to this temple procession. And I think in 220 years, it hasn't changed substantially, except of course, the crowds are much bigger. And one thing she does mention is that the earlier uh, procession was quiet, where today it's a cacophony of sound, of music, of people chanting. And as they pull, they're, they're pulling the car with the ropes the same way. And she discusses all the festivals that are celebrated in Tamil Nadu, the Dasara festivals of Ayuda Puja, where, where tools are blessed, Saraswati Puja, where um, books and learning and music are blessed. 
and of course the Pongal festival, Mylapur, I mean the, the Diwali. These are all festivals which continue today, which I have, which I celebrate every year in my house because my, my husband was Hindu and we wanted to give the culture to our children. And uh, so many of these festivals you can see actually on, on the streets. The, we have, I live in, in a street just off of where the, the uh, ministers of Tamil Nadu have their houses. And you can see everything as far as my, uh, Murugan and Mariamma, the, the, the female deity festivals take place or took place even 200 years ago. You can see them right, right on the street. The other, um, I would say the other parallel in Elizabeth's life and mine is language. Because I think we both feel that if you don't understand language, you can't understand the culture. And she, of course, learned Telugu, which was the main language during her time. Today, it's Tamil in, uh, in, in Tamil Nadu. And we both struggled to learn to read and uh, speak the language. She actually translated the Stala Purana of the temple. Um, that's the history of the temple, uh, which means that she had a very high proficiency. And she obviously, as she states in her letters, she wanted to learn about the culture through the Indians themselves. So she spent, she was much happier being with uh, Indians and learning through Indians than being with the, the, the Scottish and many of the British people. As I said, um, architecture was a, a major aspect. And uh, she, you know, she talks about, she, she explored Madras down through the Fort St. George where all the British lived to what was Blacktown and now is Georgetown. Um, and she talks of the, of the traditional Tamil house in Georgetown. Uh, we have Tamil, traditional Tam Tamil houses at our, at our center. I don't know how to bring up the other slides of Victoria, but um, I, I learned about Madras by looking at how the city expanded through the architecture from Fort St. George over on Punamali High Road, up the coast where, where she would have had her house, and then over on the Gindi Road over to, to uh, St. Thomas Mount. Uh, I've put up this one painting that she's done um, of Mowbray's Hall. This is the, uh, you can show the, 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 it's on the Adiar River. You can see the river just in front. And today it looks very similar to this. Um, I, okay, this is, the, this is the building today. It's now called the Madras Club. And uh, it was built in 1772 and used particularly on weekends for hunting and fishing and for parties. So it's very easy for me to go back in time. It has, it has a wooden spring dance floor. It has wide verandas. And uh, it, uh, you can imagine the dinners that, Big Willems and at least Mary Simon would have would have attended here uh, on the veranda with their serve their staff members standing behind them, and uh, uh, the dances that would have taken place, and you can get a feeling of what the social life of of the British would have been at that time period. She also talks I found I found very interesting of the urban developers of that time, not unlike today. She talked about young men who very quickly built these uh, British houses, single storied houses with the main hall and the two bedrooms flanking the hall and the bathrooms attached to them. Said they went and the black and white flooring. Uh, she said they went up very fast and these young men sold them or rented them out and made good money from that. So not too different from the, the uh, urban development that goes on today. Uh, there are not that many houses from that time period left. Uh, I, I talked about Fort St. George, uh, St. Mary's Church is there, and unfortunately, Elizabeth Willem's tombstone is there to see as you enter the cemetery next to the church. We have one other area where we're quite similar, which is that writing home to our parents. So I wrote daily to my mother for many, many years. Um, as you know, India was a socialist uh, 
country before 1991 when it when it liberalized, and so there was very little to buy. And as Elizabeth wrote home for bonnets and gowns and so many gloves and so many things, I would write home for dresses and clothes for my three daughters, toys. And she, Elizabeth asked for all kinds of exotic foods, but I would ask for Cheerios and, and Rice Krispies and, and maple syrup, things that you couldn't get here, which kids loved. Uh, it was a wonderful time exploring through these, uh, uh, through the correspondence. I haven't touched on, on colonialism or politics during the time. I was just thinking of visually how my life did, it does parallel in some ways uh, Elizabeth. And uh, I wonder what she would think today if she came back and saw the pollution and the traffic, the, you know, communication, the ease of communication and the huge, huge increase in population. India's population has doubled since I've come to India from 650 million when I came to 1.3 billion now. But Madras is still a wonderful city. It was a quiet city with very little population at the time she lived here. And it's now a very bustling cosmopolitan city. So. Well, thank you very much, uh, Deborah, for sharing with us your life in India and also reflecting on Elizabeth and Mary's life 200 years before. One of the... Um, parts of the research network was to look at changes in the environment over time. And so uh, there is material on the website uh, about those changes in the environment. As we know, the environment is continuing to change and that's having an impact on everyone's lives as well. Yes. I, I just want to thank our participants now and to all have joined us on the launch and to encourage you to visit the Missing Voices website and to share the sites with your friends, families, and colleagues. I'm gonna turn it back over to Jacqueline now, and thank you again for being with us today. Thanks, Victoria. And thank you to all of our panelists and all of you who tuned in. Um, but if you do have questions for our panelists, as I put in the chat, you can send them by email to roar.library. And Lauren Williams is going to put a link to the project website into the chat so you can all explore. But I do want to say a, a thank you beyond Victoria's and perhaps to Victoria, <laughs> as you can't thank yourself very easily, can you, Victoria? <laughs> um, so. I would say an enormous thank you to Victoria also for, for spearheading this initiative and to, for bringing so many partners on board and being um, a force that drove this project from the beginning and that also brought to life such a rich network through the collaboration with so many international partners, including all of our panelists today. So Minakshi, Deborah, Alicia, and in absence, Reika, thank you for contributing. It really is interesting to hear about the ways that all of you have inhabited this material and how your experiences have inflected your research. And you, in some ways, it's a conversation between you and this 200 year old material. So you're adding a chorus of new voices to those that we hear in the letters. And it's really a pleasure I am on the outside of this project, but have been promoting it and working alongside it all the way along. And it's really a pleasure to see the work come to fruition. I have a couple of thank yous to add, um, and I will keep an eye on my email to see if we have questions coming in. We have a thank you for the extremely interesting and stimulating opening, appreciating all of the different perspectives from many experts in multidisciplinary fields. Um, that's from the DMC contributor. Kathy Mitchell. So thank you for, for that comment, Kathy. Um, but my thank you is also to our digital initiatives team here at McGill who worked on this website and worked to make it as accessible and inclusive as Victoria, you mentioned. Um, so an enormous thank you to that team, to all who collaborated on that work. If you want to tune in again to Aurora event, um, our next ones coming up are continuing in that theme of craft and painting and artwork that the Gwilyms so um, expertly expressed in their artworks. Um, we are having a, an event on weaving 
on handicrafts of a different kind on December 6th. And we also have an event on paper making. Here in Montreal, there is a paper mill, the Papeterie Saint-Armand. And we're going to be talking with the, uh, the two operators, Nice Lapointe and David Carruthers. So please join us on the 13th for those craft-inspired events, the 6th and the 13th. And once again, an enormous thank you from us to all of our panelists. So on that note, unless, you, Victoria, if you want to have a last comment, <laughs> you're welcome to take the microphone back. Just a, a thank you to all who attended. It's great to see members of the network here. Um, our project, the Gwilym Project, is coming to an end at the end of uh, this year, 2022. It will live on, as Menakshi said in the book, and also in the website and in this, um, in this uh, Missing Voices website. But it has been an extraordinary, um, I can only say an opening of the mind for me in a way that was completely unexpected. I'm a historian of natural history, but I have learned so much from all my colleagues at the Gwilym Network. And I want to thank everyone who's participated in this project. So thank you again. And uh, go explore it's, the uh, site. It's been a <laughs> <laughs> so we will send the link to the website in a follow-up message and we invite you all to explore, to listen, and to dive into the world of the Golem Project through these artworks, through the photographs, through the paintings, and through the critical work that's all present on the website. So thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll sign off there. <laughs>